Okay, so um, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome Rich uh, to the series Unstoppable Speaker Series um, that we've been running now for over five years. And uh, we try to get uh, some of the most dynamic, most uh, cutting edge, uh, exciting speakers to come and talk in our series, um, share their insights, share their recent results uh, for the series uh, Center for Unstoppable Computing Community. So we're pr perfectly pleased to have Rich Rich is not only um, you know, well-suited for this role, um, he actually was a Series Unstoppable speaker, I think a couple of years ago. So he may yes. be our first repeat. So he deserves uh, kudos for that. Um, Rich is super well-known in the systems community. I first came to know him when he pioneered this idea of the network weather service, trying to you know, forecast actually what the internet's performance and traffic would be like. Very powerful idea. Um, um, and then um, later, um, he did a, a series of amazing work on um, predicting lifetimes of spot instances using time series methods um, that I think, uh, you know, had real influence not only for um, uh, the scientific contribution, but it actually changed some of uh, the webs, uh, sorry, the clouds policies. Um, he recently is, is famous for um, founding Eucalyptus, which was an open source uh, AWS uh, kind of software base, which I think is still being used to do a number of interesting things. Um, and today he's going to come talk to us about something completely different, um, but very exciting. Uh, so without further ado, I give you Rich Wolski. Andrew, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. That was a very generous introduction from, uh, from someone who uh, is, is a superstar in our field. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, and thank you again uh, for having me back. Uh, it's true. I gave a talk uh, uh, several years ago on some of our, our forecasting work for the spot market. But today, as Andrew says, I think what I'll do is, is maybe give you an outline for what's driving our research in my group now, today, uh, and, and probably will for, um, uh, for the foreseeable future. Let me share my screen here. Share. Okay. Um, so let's see. So... Uh, what we've been working on lately is thinking about what it means to go from where we are today with respect to cloud computing, uh, which is something that, that Andrew and I have both been thinking about, uh, you know, for a while, uh, and 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 really infrastructure. You know, when I, I use cloud computing as a a, a short hand for the internet, the way we use distributed digital infrastructure in society today. Um, so, so thinking about that in the context of the internet of things. And, uh, and, and, and we've been you know, building internet of things deployments for a few years now, and, and that's led to some experiences, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm gonna share, but also to some surprising conclusions, uh, which, um, which are driving the research that we're doing today. So um, to start out with, the internet of things is kind of what um, you know was the big exciting uh, focus uh, maybe ten years ago. It's kind of the AI of two thousand and nine, you know. And there were all these predictions. Uh, people were saying things like, "By twenty twenty, there's going to be fifty billion things on on the internet, or maybe seventy five billion things, or a trillion things." I, I actually believe that the um, CEO of Cisco. Uh, John Chambers said in public, although I can't, I can't dig this up in writing, that there's going to be a trillion devices on the internet by 2020. Um, that hasn't happened. There's not a trillion devices. There's, you know, conservatively about 30 million devices, uh, and even that is somewhat suspect. And and the question is, you know, why why hasn't this happened? You know, why um, hasn't this taken place? And 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 if you're wondering why there was this level of excitement, think for a moment about internet search. Uh, internet search has changed human memory, right? Originally, 3400 BC or so before that, we were doing oral histories. Then we invented writing. Then we invented the book. 
each of those inventions changed the way we remember things. 1995, we invented internet search and it revolutionized you know, society in this way. We learn differently. We speak differently. We certainly read differently. We remember things differently because of internet search. It's a revolution. Well, the internet of things is the idea that everything, and I mean everything, goes on the internet. And it has sensing and potentially actuation. This is extending human perception. This is extending what it is that you as a person can do when interacting with the universe by using digital infrastructure as an extension of your senses. So, so the way that internet search has revolutionized memory, the internet of things was thought to revolutionize experience, which is a big revolution. This could be you know, really something that is, is society changing and it hasn't happened. And, uh, and, and, and as a systems person, you know, I, my question then becomes why from a systems perspective, have we not attained this, this obviously interesting potential societal benefit, okay? And so, so now I'm gonna make three observations from our experiences about what it's like to try and do that. What, what, what obstacles uh, perhaps, or, 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 or interesting uh, point, you know, points of interest does one encounter when trying to, to put things on the internet. The first thing that we didn't expect is it's all about power. The second thing is in the internet of things, there's an activity called deployment. And deployment is really a software process in the sense that it must be engineered the way we engineer software. And the third thing is that we in the Internet of Things really need to embrace the notion of general purpose uh, as opposed to specifically built. If, you, if you're an Internet of Things person, if you're a controls person or whatever, you're doing purpose built stuff. And really, the future is going to be, you know, general purpose the way, you know, when we invented computers, they were purpose built, ballistics calculations and so on and so forth. And then we got really excited about general purpose computers and all the technologies necessary to do that. The Internet of Things has to go through that revolution. So, OK. So now um, what I'd like to do is, is, is to you know, encourage you to think a little bit about what the internet is today. The internet is, is not you know, what it was when we invented hypertext. When we invented you know, HTTP and HTML, uh, the internet was content spread all over the place, in people's living rooms, in their offices, maybe you know, uh, uh, in a shared computing system. Uh, and then companies like Google or Inc to me would cite very densely populated uh, infrastructure, data centers, like the data center on the Columbia River Gorge that I'm showing here. And that would be basically a centralized index for really widely distributed content. Okay, that is not what the internet is today. Internet content is produced in these data centers and indexed in these data centers and served from these data centers. So if you think of the internet from a content perspective, it's lots of data bouncing around in between data centers. And then every now and then it exits a data center and goes to your eyeballs, right? Okay. Uh, um, Rich? Yeah. I'm, I'm not seeing slide updates. You're not seeing slide updates. Okay, hang yeah. on a second. Let me make sure. Let me see if I can, because uh, we. I thought we tested this. So let's see. Uh, can you see the slide updates now? now? Now it's updating, yeah. Okay, sorry. I thought we tested this, but uh, but, but I guess Thank not. you. So, okay, certainly. So this is the Columbia River Gorge. These are the data centers. Um, okay, but this is where the pictures matter anyway. So, um, so you know, if, if this is where the data is for the internet, right? This is where your data lives in the internet. It, there, there's just no question. This is where it lives for IoT. It lives outside, right? This is a citrus orchard located in Visalia, California. Um, uh, and it's about 1400 miles from the nearest Amazon data center. Um, uh, this is a tremendous amount of useful data. If you're a citrus grower, uh, you're looking at all sorts of interesting things. First thing you're looking at is irrigation and hydrology, topology, wind currents. Uh, this may be a little bit of pestilence. And in particular, we're very interested in frost prevention. Uh, uh, the way frost is prevented in the Central Valley of California is typically with big wind machines first, and then with irrigation, spurious irrigation second. Uh, why? When um, uh, these uh, citrus trees 
freeze. Uh, it does get very cold here. You lose the crop. Lifetime for a citrus tree is about 20 years. If you kill your citrus tree, that's a 20 year investment that's gone. So uh, the farmers absolutely have to protect their, their asset. Um, uh, wind machines are usually propane powered, maybe diesel powered, um, uh, you know, are uh, less environmentally uh, uh, invasive um, uh, than uh, irrigation, uh, but um, not without environmental uh, invasiveness. It, it, you know, this produces a great deal of greenhouse gas um, uh, when they run. Uh, but if you can't remediate by circulating warm air aloft, down uh, to cold air below, which is where the trees freeze, then what you do is you over-irrigate because the water that you put into the roots has thermal mass. And, and when the roots take it up, uh, they, they, they stay warm enough, long enough to avoid the freeze, you hope. But you must start spraying six hours before the hard freeze or more. So you waste a tremendous amount of water when you use thermal mass to prevent frost. And in the C Central Valley of California, wasting water is absolutely a no-no. This picture is also interesting because this fan is on a 40 foot pole and we're about a kilometer away from where we need to do the internet of things, right? And the problem is to know when to turn this fan on and when to turn this fan off such that you avoid a freeze at the corners, at the boundaries of this growing block. And there are lots of fans and they're far away. This is the nearest power source. So if you're gonna run the internet of things, this is where your electricity is. Right? You can put up solar panels, but there are all sorts of problems with solar panels. Um, you need to do computing out here if you're going to do the Internet of Things. Furthermore, if you go to a company to buy such a control system, and you can, they're very expensive. Here's what the company's going to do. They're going to put a thermometer here, and they're going to put an actuator here. And this thermometer is going to send its data 1,400 miles or more off to a data center. And then it's going to send back every now and then an actuation signal to this fan to turn the fan on and off. So you're moving a data constantly from here way off to some data center far away so that you can move a signal back when this distance is a couple of hundred meters. This is not an efficient way to build a system. No one would architect a system uh, to solve this problem in that way. Okay, um, so power is everything. Uh, we are attacking this problem to provision four machines, little you know, Raspberry Pis uh, that have sensors on them and actuators on them, cost about twenty thousand dollars in terms of solar infrastructure, batteries, concrete pads, the safety stuff. Um, for twenty thousand dollars, you get in a fragile power infrastructure: uh, dust, sun angle. People drive tractors over this stuff, knock them over, move them. Um, uh, there's a theft problem, uh, you know, so on and so forth. So you're spending an awful lot for not very much. And, th and this for PCs this is, you know, $1,000 at the outside when we, all, when we all get done. So, so, you know, 20 to one in terms of the power infrastructure for not very good power infrastructure. And it's invasive. You know, I can't run, uh, I can't trench out there. Right, trenching, you know, is hard. You'll saw you saw it's underwater. Uh, you can trench around, but now it's an expensive thing. Um, uh, uh, you know, they they have usage. They don't want you digging in it. Solar towers interfere with farming operations. You can you can't really put up these big panels. They create shade. You know, you can't um, uh, easily uh, uh, move around them. You can do it, but but it's invasive. And the scaling properties are really really bad. Right, you know, as you start to make the, the power requirements go up, it gets more expensive, fragile, invasive, super linearly. Um, so, uh, so, so the first observation is, you know, if everything's gonna go on the internet, we really need to engineer for power. And, and we think of that from the mobile computing thing as battery life. It isn't battery life, it's infrastructure, right? You're, you're not engineering for power because you're worried about how long a battery will drain. You're engineering for power because it's super expensive not to and super invasive and super dangerous, so on and so forth. I mean, this is an industrial site, um, uh, you know, and there's, there's safety concerns and so on and so forth. So power is everything. That's the first observation. Okay, second observation. What's wrong with this picture? Um, uh, that, uh, this device uh, is about a $300,000 um, sensing device. It's called a flux tower. And uh, what it's built to do is measure carbon sequestration. 
uh, there are pumps that are pumping water into the soil here. Uh, this is a water source. Um, uh, there's a number of, of chemical assays that are done on board. There are three data loggers, and then there's a weather station. Uh, this is a sonic um, wind and temperature gauge. Um, uh, and, uh, and the idea is that they wanted to measure carbon CO2 capture in the soil in growing regions, uh, state of California and, and a privately funded uh, project. To do this, they put these things up all over central California. Um, the problem is this is really in the wrong place, right? This farm has been active since, I don't know, turn of the 20th century. This is a burn pit. You cannot measure carbon sequestration in a burn pit. This device was never designed to be put in a, in a place where there's been charcoal for 100 years. Now, how does this happen? How did we take a $300,000 device and stick it in the wrong place? The answer is deployment um, was not part of the development process. There were two separate development teams. One that built that very expensive device to do carbon sequestration with you know, finely calibrated instruments and the, all of the software programming and wiring necessary to do that. And another team that was in charge of deployment. And they went out and said, look, wow, it's a flat space and it's off the road and the sun angle is good and there's power not too far away and we can get to it. Let's put it here. The, you know, we, we, we really said, um, uh, what we say is the deployment team missed the scrum, right? When you're engineering here for the internet of things, you're not building it for a data center where it's standardized and it's, it's constructed and you know there's going to be power. You know, you're building it for an in-situ environment and that affects what you do. So either you want to build a different sensor if you're going to measure in a burn pit or you want to put this in a different place. And, uh, and so, so the, the you know, motto here is deployment is software. Deployment is part of what you have to think about, engineer for, incorporate into your design and, and your development, um, much more so in an internet context than in a cloud context, where we've got this virtualized set of abstractions that more or less is standardized regardless of how you're going to deploy. Not entirely, but way more so than the physical world. Okay, so that's what went wrong. What went right? Well, they gave us this thing, right? These people were gonna rip it out of the ground, but it's not actually in, impacting their farming operations. And because uh, the deployment team was really careful. And they said, Rich, do you want this? I'm like, yes, of course I want this. I'm a college professor and that's an expensive monitoring system. Give it to me. And they said, okay, it's yours. You, you may do whatever you want with it. But we had to repurpose it. We had to go in and reprogram the data loggers and, uh, and change what it was measuring um, uh, and, and, and that turned out to be really, really hard. You know, the model for Internet of Things today is rip and replace. Your car has this model. You have all these sensors in your car and they're constantly monitoring things. And when something goes wrong, you take it to a mechanic and they yank it out and they put a new one in. And it's not gonna work for the Internet of Things, right? Repurposing this thing was very, very hard. The networking was atrocious. It was completely insecure. It was never designed, you know, for the kind of monitoring and actuation that we were trying to, to incorporate. Um, it was designed for a very, very different, you know, much more detached purpose. We got all that fixed and lo and behold, we blew the power budget. The batteries and the solar panel that are there were just not enough to allow us to repurpose this. So, what I suggest is given that these things have long lifetimes, that thing has been there a while and now we're gonna have it there for a lo much longer while, it's an expensive device, it's designed to be very long life. We have to really think about repurposing for these physically placed deployed devices. And we don't engineer at the device level for repurpose, we engineer for rip and replace. So in this 2025 world where we were expecting trillions of devices and we didn't get them, Here's kind of what we see. We really need to think about engineering our systems for power. We really need to think about software engineering for deployment. We have to build for repurpose. And, and strangely, if you take those three things um, together, you come to a weird conclusion, which is, or at least we came to it, the internet is built backwards. That the current infrastructure that we're putting together is really reversed engineered for the, the, for, uh, the reverse use case from what we're gonna see. And I'll see if I can explain that to you. Today, 
the internet, as it is um, uh, uh, instantiated by cloud computing uh, and and um, content consumption, is really you know driven. Its killer application is e-commerce and entertainment. And I'm lumping social networking into the e-commerce space because it's really an advertising business. But but you know maybe you could add social networking to this. But it's really e-commerce and entertainment. And and e-commerce and entertainment works this way. Um, you know, on the right, you have this large infrastructure. It's centralized. Um, uh, it's carefully managed. It's extremely efficient. And what it does is it uh, generates content, which is lots and lots of bits. And those bits flow from these content generation sites, these very, very large um, uh, infrastructures, to you and mass. And then every now and then something comes back, but it's very short and it's very fast, right? Because what a lot of this content is trying to do is get your response uh, at a specific moment in time to gauge what your preferences are in economic terms. Preferences means what you'll buy and what you'll pay. And, uh, and so, so the game now is to produce lots and lots of data and then watch for these incredibly valuable, but very, very short-lived responses. And to try to correlate those valuable and short-lived responses with what it is that you've just been sent. And so to do that requires big data. There's an awful lot that you have to generate. And then you have to capture an awful lot of these very valuable, but, but extremely small pieces of information. They, they convey a lot, but they do so in a very small package. Because they're so valuable, you have to store all of them. And to make the inferences that you wanna make about individuals, you have this big data problem. You have to take lots and lots of samples because you're gonna cut the samples up into clusters where each of us belong to a cluster and have a statistically meaningful sample in that cluster means you have to start with a giant population. So there's big data. And then there's lots of statistics. You know, Neural networks is really just logistic regression in some form. You're doing lots and lots of regressions in this cluster data. So you're categorizing and then you're regressing, but you gotta do this on a massive scale. And you're producing all this content that's trying to induce these very, very rare events. Okay? So, and, and, but the goal of this is really to make an inference or prediction about a human being. And that's an incredibly difficult problem. That is a hard problem to do. We haven't been able to predict people very well, at least in terms of their preferences until recently. It's a, you know, this, this is, it's a miracle that it works. That's what's really going on with the cloud today. Think about the internet. The internet is not, for internet of things, it's not built this way, right? It's not a ton of content coming from the cloud. It's a ton of things sending content to the cloud, right? I mean, you know, so the data flow is completely different. Think about Amazon's worst day. Here's Amazon's worst day. Amazon.com's worst day is that all people on earth decide to buy something at 12 noon, you know, Chicago time on a Wednesday, right? That is 4 billion clicks coming from the planet, all of which need to be, you know, safely captured, write one semantics, charge for the credit card. Amazon will melt if that happens. They are not built for it. They're built to send you lots and lots of data and to take a credit card click, you know, rarely. Okay, this is a trillion devices sending credit card clicks every 200 milliseconds. Not four billion, a trillion. It's not gonna be this. It's not the cloud. Not the way it's architected today. The other thing is, it's not big data, right? Uh, you know, what happens in that growing block in Visalia is interesting in Visalia. It's interesting in that growing block. It's not interesting in Boston. It's not interesting in North Dakota. Uh, you know, if you think about the smart home, when you open your refrigerator door, that event means a lot in your home. It means something interacting with your uh, HVAC system. It may mean something in terms of your dietary control. It may mean something in terms of informing, you know, your, your grocery delivery service. But what's going on in your living room isn't so interesting in Boston unless we're doing the surveillance economy thing, unless we're trying to sell you something. But if we're just trying to actuate something, data is very, very localized. So you have lots and lots of data sets that are not that huge. Instrumenting your refrigerator 
you know, and, and your HVAC system doesn't generate terabytes and terabytes, petabytes of data, right? But it does generate lots of such data sets, right? And notice that there are little signals that go back, start the fan, stop the fan, every now and then. It's backwards. It's backwards from what we do with the internet today. And, and this is just, you know, a couple of things that, that we go by in our group. Um, first is I have an IoT data conjecture, which is that, um, you know, the actual relevance to this data for IoT decays like the square of the distance from where it's gathered, right? You, you're, you're not getting anything. The, the story I tell is I have a collaborator, Chandra Prince, and she went to North Dakota to talk about this work. And she was giving a talk and she said, you know, we're working on the water problem in California. And the North Dakota farmer said, oh, thank God, someone's going to get rid of the water. You know, when the snow melts, you get all the slush and then you get root rot and the tractors get stuck. Somebody's finally going to figure out how to get rid of the water. And Chandra's like, um, no, we live in California. We're not trying to get rid of the water. We, we need the water. This just tells you it's regional, right? You know, this just tells you that these IoT problems, you know, are governed by where they are in many respects, as long as we're not talking about the surveillance economy. And... Uh, and, and so this means that the more you're moving the data, sort of the farther away from where it's relevant, it's likely to be going, right? And then the second thing we found is the more you move the data, the more expensive your system gets, the more power you're gonna use, particularly if you're using radios, and the more failure prone your system is, the more attack surface there is, so on and so forth. So, so you know, it, it's a very, very different world than the cloud world in terms of how we think about, at least in our group, how we think about managing the data. Okay, now, why, why is IoT hard to do from a programming perspective, okay? This is Amazon's um, uh, sort of tutorial graph for, that goes with their IoT SDK. So we're gonna program Amazon to do something. And I asked one of my students um, uh, to do this, to build uh, a Hello World program that would generate Hello World on a small, low-powered device. Um, uh, and then have that appear uh, in an Amazon database, okay? So we're gonna send Hello World as a test string from a small low power radio connected device uh, to Amazon. Here's what the student had to do. First thing the student had to do is get it to work on this device. The Amazon SDK code that is available for devices did not work on this device. It's a low power device. It has a small memory, but it's a new one. It's got a bunch of built-in features that we wanted to exploit. It's not one of the standard ones. It's not Alexa, um, uh, it's not one of the old ones that Amazon has. So student had to build essentially an entire infrastructure for this device that was gonna be compatible with Amazon's SDK that would generate the string hello world. Second thing the student had to do, sorry, is to implement MQTT. MQTT is a protocol, a network communication protocol for PubSub, developed for the powered internet, not for radio systems, not for Zigbee low power radio or low run, but for the internet. So they had the student basically built an MQTT protocol implementation for this device, and in the process had to port someone else's TCP stack um, uh, because MQTT rests on TCP not on, say, a much more power-efficient um, uh, networking protocol. Then the student had to learn to program uh, Amazon's IoT Core, which is a big, whacking uh, set of Python for interfacing um, uh, devices that communicate via MQTT to Amazon, largely as web service clients. In order to do that, the student had to learn Amazon's Certificate Authority and TLS, which is compliant, but non-standard. This took like six weeks and Amazon couldn't help him. Amazon, we, we were actually calling Amazon and talking with them about why the TLS uh, in section four wouldn't work with MQTT in tune because we thought we were implementing TLS uh, correctly. Turns out we were, Amazon implements it correctly in a different way. Um, uh, and, and I mean, no end of fun, six weeks on just that step. Then the student had to learn to use uh, S3, uh, which is their object store, because we were going to use AWS Lambda, which the student also had to learn, which is a triggered computation mechanism, uh, really good for event-driven uh, programming inside the cloud so that the student could ultimately push something into a database, Elastic MapReduce in this case. OK, now, start to finish this was a 12-week effort. This student is a really, really good programmer. 
If you're in business, imagine you want to start an IoT business. Big problem in business is recruiting talent. Recruiting a programmer, let alone a programming manager, who is facile with all seven of these technologies, let alone all the intermediate stuff, is just about impossible. And this person is going to be very expensive. Nobody does this. Nobody does this, right? I mean, it's just not possible. And, and Amazon on the right here, these things are changing, right? They change the APIs. There's new feature all the time. There are new boards being developed all the time. This is a placeholder. This is not how IoT is going to work. It's just not. It's way too complicated. It's way too layered. All of these technologies were developed for web services. These devices are not web service clients. This is just a way to make them masquerade as web service clients until we can figure out how to make this work. So if it's not that, what is it? Well, it probably, we think, has some things in common with that. The cloud world has taught us a lot. And in particular, one of the things it's taught us is that services, building things out of services is really useful. Uh, why? Well, services are reactive. And so this makes them extremely efficient. They wake up, they do stuff, and they go to sleep. And that wake up, do stuff, go to sleep cycle requires a certain programming style and certain kinds of uh, storage requirements and so on and so forth. But you get a very robust, efficient system uh, that you can you know, make work over long periods of time when you use that kind of architecture. Okay, they hide infrastructure detail. You're programming behind an API. They're, you know, uh, it's very virtualized. This, when you can connect with a service, you don't know what hardware, what architecture is behind it. You're really working with it at a functional level uh, that's described by its API. So you get very, very, you know, uh, programmable and reprogrammable um, uh, abstraction out of services. And in particular, the deployment piece of it is programmed. We have deployment uh, technologies for web services, but it sits behind the API. And we're constantly changing them, right? Amazon is constantly changing its service catalog without changing the API sometimes, as evidenced by the spot market. And so it's repurposable, right? And then you get these you know, emerging standards which makes them portable. Okay, so if all of that is true, then what we should be doing is running services on the IoT devices. The services go on the devices. That's how we build this repurposable, program power efficient, reprogrammable, long live, robust infrastructure. We do it with services and the devices is where the computation is doing and we wanna move the data as little as possible from the devices. Ergo, we need to flip the internet around. We need to put the cloud on the devices and we need to put the clients in the cloud. Okay, so we've been working on this model. We call it devices as services. Um, uh, and really the, the key thing to get around that hard programming problem is to make it what we call multi-scale. So rather than having seven or eight or 10 or a hundred different technologies, all of which were built to do different things that are then amalgamated, we're trying to build a single system, one environment, this specifically for IoT right, from the cloud to the device. And because we want to be able to run services at the device, we really need it to be multi-scale in terms of resource capacity. So you should be able to run a service on a device, on an edge computer, on a private cloud, or on the public cloud, and have it be the same service, the same service, not a bunch of different technologies. It has to be able to give you efficiency across resource scales, right? And it should be common set of abstractions, um, uh, and, but, but to do this, we're employing another cloud innovation called functions as a service. Functions as a service is a triggered computational model, which is cloud only uh, for the most part, uh, which means that it lives within a public cloud, generally speaking, at least the commercial ones do. But what it does is allow you to build very reactive, lightweight, and cost-efficient web services when your web service is characterized by high idle time between requests. It's far more cost efficient to use a functions as a service um, mechanism in a, in a public cloud today uh, if you have such a web service um, uh, than it is to stand up an instance and run an instance in it um, because you're not paid for the time between when you're waiting for requests. And IoT has this property, which is long idle times and short bursts of, of, of activity, largely for power optimization purposes. So it's the right model, and it already exists in the clouds. Uh, and so the question we asked is, could we take that model and crush it down so we could run it at the device level? Because if we could, we could either skin the functions as a service things 
uh, that the clouds have behind the same API or port our infrastructure. Uh, and we've done both. So uh, the thing that we uh, came up with is called CSpot, which stands for the, services, the serverless platform of things in C. Uh, serverless computing is a, as a synonym for functions as a service. It really shouldn't be. It, it, it's that because when you use functions as a service in a cloud, you don't have to provision servers. You send the cloud functions and then it executes those functions for you. So, so it's called serverless sometimes. Uh, and so, so we took that serverless thing for our, uh, our acronym, but it's really you know, multi-scale functions as a service. Right? And so uh, we can run CSpot on everything from those tiny little microcontrollers with 80K, 80K of memory and 512K of flash, all the way up to the public clouds. Um, uh, and they are source code level uh, portable, which means if you recompile, you can't run you know, multi-controller multi, uh, um, code uh, on the x86, but if you recompile uh, or cross-compile, which is how we do it now, um, uh, the same code runs everywhere. To do that really uh, requires a, a single storage abstraction um, uh, for, you know, that, that spans all of these platforms. And that storage abstraction is append only and log based. Append only gives you things like um, eventual consistency for scale and log based allows you to implement protocols like strong consistent protocols like raft over the top of that. Um, uh, and it's event driven. Uh, the way CSpot works is that you can only, uh, you know, it's event driven model, but there's only one event. And that event is, uh, a storage event. So the only way to trigger a computation in CSpot is to store something. And that's so that the system is robust because it means that a CSpot program has all of its program state in stable storage, in append-only stable storage at any moment, which means that you can stop and then start CSpot any place and it will pick up from where it left off. It's constantly checkpointing is another way to think of it, right? And then also it gives you things like, because it's log-based, you can do rollback, you can do roll forward, you can do data repair. There's a bunch of other database-y kinds of things you get out of this model. But, but crucially, it's built to be very, very robust because these things go up and down all the time. It's open source uh, and we're about to release 2.0, which has got a much better build model and, um, uh, and it's more scalable, it's just a bunch of improvements at 2.0. But um, uh, uh, please join us and contribute. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're excited uh, to be working with folks on this. Uh, but the takeaway from CSpot, if you're, you know, if you're not sort of down in the weeds with it, is you can build multi-scale network-facing microservices, nanoservices, things that, that will really run on the smallest of the small all the way up to the tallest of the tall. We run it at UCSB. Uh, uh, as part of our um, IoT experiments, we work with um, farmers on agricultural problems primarily, and uh, uh, you know, but some some you know um, resource sustainability problems, uh, and then ecology. We're, we're we're working with ecologists on sustainability questions and land use questions. They actually use some of our stuff to do hunting license determination uh, in in a nearby county, um, uh, you know, uh, based on on animal population counts and things of this nature. So, um, but the way we do it is we run uh, CSpot. Uh, on the devices. And then we typically cite um, a small edge uh, uh, cloud. This actually runs Eucalyptus. We, we, we put a small installation of AWS on site, often in uh, an outbuilding uh, or a closet. So this is unattended, um, rugged uh, deployment, but it's near where the devices are so that this connection can be made a low power radio. Um, uh, and not some sort of high power, long distance Wi-Fi. Um, uh, and then, uh, but we can run services. We can run AWS services very, very near where the data is. Um, that doesn't work. Uh, we can move the data back to UCSB where we have a fairly large uh, cloud installation, again, running AWS services. So the cloud infrastructure here and here is the same. And then if you run an AWS, although we do run in these others, you, you can get the same cloud infrastructure here. But importantly, CSpot runs in all of these places. This doesn't have to be AWS. It just has to be someplace that runs CSpot. Again, this runs CSpot, and we can run CSpot in the, the public cloud. And so you can get one infrastructure. Your services can look the same from the public clouds all the way down to the devices. OK, now, how efficient is this? Um, we went off and benchmarked CSpot against AWS. 
Uh, and we've done this against Azure as well. Um, uh, we haven't done Google Functions uh, nearly as well, but we will. Uh, uh, and, and here's the comparison. These are the C-spot numbers on a bunch of different devices, an ESP8266 microcontroller, Raspberry Pi, Intel NUC, oh, it was a pretty fast uh, processor, our cloud, uh, and an EC2 uh, written in C running in an instance. And the dispatch time for a single function is shown here. So these are slower devices. We're about 38 milliseconds, um, four milliseconds, five milliseconds. And then C spot, this is dispatch where the function handler is in C. If you, the function handler is in Python, it's 18. AWS Lambda's dispatch for the same function handler in Python is 253 milliseconds. We are two orders of magnitude, right? In C, faster than Lambda. That's two orders of magnitude more power efficient. And Lambda cannot run on these devices. Lambda can run in the form of green grass in a reduced capacity on the Raspberry Pi, and it's an order of magnitude faster than the Pi. At the time, it didn't work. When we took these numbers, you couldn't even run green grass on the Pi, but it's, it's merely an order of magnitude faster than AWS. It's also an order of magnitude faster than Azure, right? Rich, so Rich. here, yep, go ahead. Rich, can I ask yep. a question? So yep. um, one of the visions that's being pushed by these hyperscale cloud providers is, as you, you just mentioned, green grass, right? Is this notion that they're gonna extend out to the edge Mm -hmm. right, by multiplying their number of points of presence by hundredfold, right, or more. Right. Um, right. So if, if, if they do that, you know, how does that compare to the kind of software architecture that you're espousing here? Yeah, I think, you know, one of two things will happen. Either it will be this architecture and they will, or it's going to be the surveillance economy. So far, it's still the surveillance economy. Greengrass only will trigger a function. It's got no storage capabilities. It, it, it doesn't do disconnected operation very well. For sure, it doesn't do disconnected operation with respect to TLS and um, uh, uh, authentication. It's really built just to give you, you know, um, a, a lower latency computational response. And that's part of it, but it's not the architecture. Now, they could do it, right? I mean, they could put energy into pushing the cloud infrastructure out the way they have with outposts. So AWS, for example, has now got a not fully featured, but more fully featured um, uh, on-premise uh, thing called outposts. But it doesn't work with disconnected operation very well. It doesn't authenticate well. You know, the, the, the cloud providers have a business model which is predicated on their acquiring and holding your data. And this model is not built for that. This model is predicated on having the data live way out at the edge and, and the cloud provider doesn't get access to it. So it's not clear to me that their business model as it's currently formulated will admit something like this, but they certainly could. They certainly could pivot to an IoT world in which they don't control the data. They're really trying to sell you the, the access to that data through a really, really fully featured shareable API, you know, GUI hoster. Um, uh, if they go to that model, then yeah, I think it's going to look like CSpot or something like it. Thanks. Sure, it's, good. it's a great question. Okay, so here's Azure. Uh, this is a little bit more uh, with the edge. We got um, uh, IoT Hub uh, and IoT Edge to work. Uh, and this, this, this device, this is a new device. We couldn't get Amazon's code to work on, on this device, but we did get Azure's uh, device. And it's a little bit nice. It's got hardware cryptography. It's got built-in Wi-Fi. It's got a little bit more memory. So this, was, this is the one we're trying to field out for the frost prevention one, um, uh, frost prevention pro problem. And again, it's an order of magnitude better. Azure's worked on this more. They've got this thing called um, farm beats. And they put more into their IoT, but it's the same architecture. It's the same architecture as Amazon. They're just a little bit better at, and they, they probably bumped into some of the problems that we bumped into, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, concretely. So it's not two orders of magnitude; it's one. Um, uh, with this said, our authentication mechanism, which is a capability-based system, is three orders of magnitude more efficient than TLS. So, so you know, we can uh, do this. now. And by the way, um, you, this is evidence for, um, you know, the cloud providers not taking this seriously. I mean, if you think about this for a moment, this is five graduate students outrunning the most technologically advanced digital development of humankind by two orders of magnitude. 
Now, I've got really, really good graduate students, just like Andy does, just like you do, right? These are the smartest people on earth and they're really good. But there's an army of smart people working for these cloud people. And, and you know, as much as I respect my grad students, they aren't doing this because they're that much better. They're doing this because the cloud people are not trying, right? The cloud has not embraced this as being meaningful. They've got this technology in place, but it's much more about data acquisition than it is about problem solving. So until that happens, there's lots and lots of room for research. There's lots of ways to get in there and not have to fight the question of, yeah, but the cloud is doing this already, right? Because they're not paying attention to this yet. And, and hopefully some of the you know, informed research will help them understand you know, what this infrastructure needs to look like when they get around to making it real. Okay, so I'll start to sum up and make some predictions, right? What, what will the future look like? In the future, there's gonna be an infrastructure for doing this. You know, it, 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 I showed that UCSB picture where we have this three-tiered kind of architecture or four-tiered kind of architecture, depending on how you wanna look at it. Um, I think of that as the cloud, right? I think of that as the cloud of tomorrow, not as separate clouds, but as, as one infrastructure. And, and, and that's actually sort of happening um, uh, today in a funny way. So um, uh, Netflix, uh, uh, you know, is famously all cloud. Netflix had uh, some data centers when they were shipping CDs to track where the CDs went and so on and so forth. But when they got rid of their CD business, they got rid of their data centers. They do everything in Amazon. But interestingly, they serve absolutely no content from Amazon. None. Amazon runs the recommendation engine and runs the credit card database. All the content is served from these things called content distribution networks. These are third party hosted services that live basically in the cable data centers, cable TV data centers. Um, and when you go to your uh, uh, set-top box and pull up Netflix and watch a video, that video is being served from something in your cable data center almost assuredly. Netflix hosts no content in the cloud because it's not efficient to do so. They've pushed the content to the edge. Okay, IoT is gonna pull the content to the edge. And in fact, what we say when we put these these clouds out there is we, we've got a service distribution network. The way a content distribution network serves content at the edge, we think you know, our, our little micro clouds that live out on the edge are distributing AWS services uh, or C-spot services at the edge. And so, so I think that's gonna be the future and it's gonna be integrated. It's not gonna be a bunch of silos that are then stitched together. You're really gonna see a platform, the way the cloud is a platform. Um, uh, uh, you know, but it will be distributed. And, and there's a whole spate of problems, uh, you know, in distribution, registry, you know, uh, data reliability, trustworthiness, and so on and so forth, that, that needs to be investigated in this space. Um, I, you know, I, I talked to some folks at Google, and I picked this idea, and they took me aside and they said, you know, you're absolutely right. This is the way it's going to look. We don't know how to secure it. That was, that. I, I passed out, right? I mean, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Really? Really, I'm right? And they're like, yep, we think it's gonna look this way, but we don't know how to, to secure it. So until we do, uh, we're not gonna do it. And, uh, and, and it's gonna look the way it looks now. I'm like, okay, fine. So, um, uh, but you know, does blockchain play a role? Blockchain, permission blockchain looks really interesting, except it's not very power efficient, right? All that mining is, is really, really power wasteful. Um, or not wasteful, that's really the, 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 the work part. So, so, you know, amalgamating ideas from blockchain um, with this power is everything idea, I think is an extremely interesting area. And I think that's gonna happen. Uh, and, you know, the C-spot stuff, boy, it is a sport for those who love tedious programming. It's really hard to write a C-spot program, really hard. Um, uh, I think of it as the assembly language. You know, you've got these building blocks and you can configure them every which way from Sunday and they're robust and they do what you tell them to do. But boy, it's hard to debug. And, you know, there are, we, we, you know, there are no high level abstractions for this. Um, uh, you know, you're really in the weeds and that's just not how this is going to accelerate. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's like programming the internet with HTTP. It's just, it's just horrible. So we need, you know, things that are higher level. We need standardization. We need programming abstractions for it. Uh, some people in our group are working on these things, but lots of area of research. Um, another question that comes up is, 
you know, AI and IoT are often um, uh, uh, put together. And, um, and I think this is true. I think there's an awful lot that AI and IoT need to do together. But I think we're going to see a resurgence of high-performance computing. And here's why. AI, neural networks, are really good at predicting human behavior in the way that we discussed. But IoT is often the interaction of human beings with the environment. And the environment can be modeled really efficiently by things that are not neural networks. Neural networks can, we find, model you know, physical phenomena, but they're very inefficient about it. You need tons and tons of data for your training set. And for some problems like in quantum physics or whatever, this may be necessary, but there's an awful lot of the environment that we figured out how to model extremely efficiently based on physical models. And so I think the future is gonna be AI combined with physical model, this fusion of physical modeling and neural networks as a way of fusing human interaction with the environment through this extended perception. So, um, uh, and, and we see that a lot in our space. You know, in our world, we're working on a decision support system for this frost prevention. It incorporates an online computational fluid dynamics model. A CFD model is a classic HPC thing. It's not an AI thing at all. Right, it's it's uh, you know Navier-Stokes equations, um, uh, but you know we've got you know a neural network that's trying to figure out okay when do you want to turn the fan off when do you want to turn the fan on what time of year is it what's your yield prediction so on and so forth. so so these things are coming together. Uh, I think the cloud is going to be tiered, right? And uh, you know, and I think this notion of energy efficiency in computer science, the architects have been studying this for a long time and Andrew's been studying it forever. But, um, uh, but this idea about programming for this, how we build software systems that are aware of this, how we build robustness mechanisms, security mechanisms that are aware of energy efficiency. You know, this is really where computer science in a broader sense can meet energy efficiency. And, and UCSB has an energy efficiency institute, which has got you know, solid state lighting people in it and, and quantum people in it and so on and so forth, and computer scientists who are working on problems like this, which I think is very, very interesting. Lastly, you know, when you go to get, try to get a job at Facebook or Google or, or uh, um, Amazon, they give you these little programming quizzes. Can you code binary search? Can, you know, how do you do a hash table? What, whatever, all this kind of stuff. They want to see you code Python without an editor or without a compiler. Fine, whatever. I think this is the future. It's not going to be, what does your code look like? It's what have you built? Um, uh, this is one of our grad students. Uh, this is a grad student uh, at, at Fresno State. This is an outbuilding. It used to be 135 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer in this tin building. This is a water pump that's servicing a reservoir that's about 15 meters to her right. Uh, her infrastructure has to survive this for years. That's not easy to do. And, and it isn't a programming problem alone. You really have to know what you're doing in order to be able to make things work in these environments. So, you know, the, the cubicle that our grad students live in when they're developing these things involves jeans and boots and hats and drones and, and, and fresh air and, uh, and a whole bunch of other things beyond just, you know, um, uh, hacking away in the lab, which they do as well. Um, so I think this is kind of changing how computer science is. It's much more of a contact sport. It's much more of a multidisciplinary, um, uh, uh, you know, applications-driven uh, activity than perhaps some of the things that, that, that we've done uh, in the past. And I'll stop there and say thank you. Uh, I introduce you to an extremely talented group of, of very dedicated graduate students. Uh, this work is joint with myself and, and Dr. Chandra Krintz. Um, uh, at UCSB, we, we, we head this lab together and, and work on these problems, um, you know, as partners. Uh, and, we've, and we've had some very generous support from uh, funding agencies. Uh, the, and I'll stop there and, and take any questions that you've got. Terrific. Thanks, Rich. Um, why don't uh, people just uh, unmute and go ahead and chat out questions if they, they have them. Um, Hey, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Rich, for the presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, a bit about uh, any analytics that uh, you might be offering with through this uh, system, and what is your views in general on analytics on the edge, like directly on edge devices or closer to the edge, let's say. Thank yeah, you. it's a, it's a great question. So um, we've done we've done analytics as part of this work, uh, and 
And, but it, very nascent, in a very, very nascent way. Here's what we've found so far. Um, a lot of the problems that we're working on, and I want to say we're working on simple problems, but we're not working on very, very complicated problems uh, because we're trying to look at it from a systems perspective. But the problems we're working on fall in, have fallen into two categories. Either there is a relatively straightforward analytical approach largely based on some kind of regression uh, that we can push to the edge and we can push it all the way to the edge because regression can be done pretty efficiently. Um, especially if you start thinking about IOT in terms of duty cycle, like in an agricultural context, we're running our devices on about a five minute duty cycle. We wake them up, take a measurement and go back to sleep. Five minutes is fast in this world, lightning fast. I went out, we were working with the wine industry and I said, you know, it might take me two weeks to compute this. And they're like, two weeks? <laughs> we're harvesting in six months, you know? And so, uh, so really you're working with different time constants uh, with some of these kinds of things. There, you're running linear regression. It's not running in 30 nanoseconds or whatever it is, who cares? Um, you're really worried about power uh, at, that, at, at that level. So um, yeah, things that are bigger, uh, we you know, like we had to run a very very large clustering uh, algorithm for soil moisture analysis. There was no reason to do that at the edge. A, the device is not an online device. It, you 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 drag a, a device through a field, and it doesn't have the capability to radio what it's measuring in real time. It's just not designed that way. Uh, B, there's no value in a real-time measurement. They, what they want to do is basically 3D soil mapping so they can go in and put irrigation sensors in, uh, irrigation uh, uh, valve control in uh, at different places. And so, so the application sort of drives you off the edge itself based on the way they do it. Now, that doesn't mean we couldn't invent a new application where real-time monitoring of soil might be useful. And, and when you start talking to them about these kinds of things, they get excited, the farmers do. But, um, uh, but what we try to do is look at the problem that they're solving and the way they solve it and then bring the system to that rather than build a brand new system and try to get them to use it. And there, um, uh, what we found is a set of analytics that just, just don't make sense at the edge. Now, we hypothesize that, uh, that anything we do in a data center, you're going to want to do at the edge in some capacity and vice versa. We just have not found that to be true yet. Great, thank you. Sure. Image processing, by the way, is where that really comes into play. So um, we do have an application today where we've pushed TensorFlow to this edge cloud. We haven't pushed it all the way to a device because it's too big and too heavy, but we did push it into a closet. And the reason is the site we're working with has a bunch of camera traps and a very, very fast local network. They put up lots of solar panels so that they could do communication between the cameras in this remote area very quickly. But the connection from that area back to where we have large infrastructure is very poor. So there are these kinds of things where you have good connectivity that is connected to large infrastructure by bad connectivity. And there um, uh, we have pushed uh, TensorFlow uh, and but no GPUs because the closet can't take the heat. So, uh, so we did all these fancy things with AVX and, and the vector instructions in the x86 to try to do as efficient TensorFlow as possible at the edge. And, and, and that's working out to be effective, but, but that's really the only example we've got. And it's really just image processing. It's not, it's not a full analytics. Great, thank you. Truly. Other questions? Let, let me jump in here while you guys are thinking. Uh, I'm curious about the, this question of so computing, actually, a lot of software and a lot of hardware systems behave like a parasitic technology. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, when you buy a laptop and you plug it in in your house, you know, Intel or Apple or whomever didn't pay for that power infrastructure that supports the thing uh, and, and so on. So there's this notion that you get to be a free rider in a lot of ways. So I'm curious if maybe the cloud people are thinking or maybe there's a natural divide between the kinds of systems that you've been building, Rich, where you really have to sort of carry your own water right? Yeah. Whatever energy you have, whatever infrastructure you have, you, you produced it versus, you know, folks who are trying to build IOT devices and systems that are in some sense parasitic. They assume all of this capability and context for free, and they're trying to 
you know, innovate on top of that. And perhaps the software story is the same as well for the, the stack. Yeah, and, and I think it's an interesting question as to whether you need two different worlds or one. Like the smart cities work is very much in, in line with what you're saying, right? You know, and a lot of the IoT stuff is focused on smart cities. And, and, it's, and that delineation is right there. You know, in a smart cities context, you're assuming there's the internet. You're assuming there's wireless networking. You're assuming there's cellular networking. You're assuming power is ubiquitous. Uh, you're assuming security is ubiquitous. You can lock things up uh, easily. Um, uh, you know, repair people can get to your stuff immediately, so on and so forth. And, and so, so you see applications come out of that space that I think, um, you know, benefit from all of that extant infrastructure uh, and, and extend it in some way. And I think that's worthwhile. I think it's interesting. The question that I have, you know, that, that we're trying to explore is, is, do you need two separate systems? Or, or, or should you be thinking in that smart cities context about a reduced infrastructure footprint? Because frankly, if you could do away with some of that stuff, you might be able to have more of whatever else. You could have instrumented parks, for example, or, uh, or, or white spaces, or, or, or you're generating less carbon footprint um, uh, you know, because your, your infrastructure is sparse. Um, but I think, I think that's, that's important to recognize is that you can approach this problem from the problem of, look, there's all this infrastructure and I'm gonna be parasitic on it. And I'm gonna try and, and do something like, tell you where the open parking spaces are in Los Angeles. Like that's a really interesting smart cities problem. Um, uh, you know, or, or do the instrument at home, you know, where we, we work with uh, uh, folks at a diabetes clinic here, uh, where what they'd like to do is know when children have exceeded or, or gone outside the, the, the boundaries of what they should be eating. And, and, and so parents, because children with type 1 diabetes can die in their sleep if they are not honest about what sugar they've had, and children are not always honest about the sugar they eat, would like an instrument at home that essentially conducts surveillance on their children so that they can understand you know, whether the child you know, is in some danger. They don't want that information shared with everybody. Clearly, you're going to want to keep that kind of invasive uh, um, surveillance to yourself. So there's a huge security problem. But the infrastructure is there, right? You've got the power. Um, uh, you, you need a local internet processing because you're not sending that to the cloud, right? I mean, you just can't for security and privacy reasons. Um, uh, but um, uh, but there are interesting problems, I think, it, you know, in that space. Uh, that that aren't as extreme, um, you know, perhaps as the problems we've taken on. But but the view that I have is, if you can solve the problems we are taking on, then you're going to be able to solve these problems, but not vice versa. Now you might not be able to solve them as efficiently, right? Certainly, but um, but but from a functionality perspective, I'm confident we can take what we do and move it into a smart city. I'm not confident we can take what happens in a smart city and move it out to smart land or whatever. Other questions? Sure, uh, I'll jump in. Uh, yeah, really, really cool talk, Rich. Um, I thought you know the points you were making about how um, you know misguided or insufficiently thought through uh, kind of the programming infrastructures were for a lot of this. Um, so there's a group of us actually at U Chicago who've been you know thinking uh, a bit about you know kind of you know, what is the right abstraction. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on you know you talked about collaboration with the farmers. Like, what role should the farmers like have, or kind of the kind of domain experts have in kind of programming these systems? Because you know we've been thinking about this from the sense of end user programming and like kind of where do you see that fitting in? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, and we struggle with this all the time and it surprises me every time we go through an exercise with the farmers. So um, what, uh, what I will say about um, farmers, you know, is, is both surprising and unsurprising. First thing is they're spatial. I, 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 this sounds obvious, but you know, um, they're spatial in ways that are more than graphical. Right. They they really do think about, um, you know, their growing environment in some multidimensional space. It's not high dimensional. Right. You know, it's it's three space and then some set of atmospheric dimensions, moisture content, radiation, wind, you know, these kinds of things are, are part of their spatial locality. And, and, and they are sensitive to topology. 
and, and how that influences the space. So, um, uh, you know, so, so they think this way, their models are spatial. Um, uh, and, and so when we present information to them, we always start with, it's gotta be spatial. Now, with that said, they surprise us all the time with how much they think like data scientists. So um, uh, I, I'll give you one of the many failures <laughs> that we've had in this space. We designed uh, a weather, a, a nanoclimate weather uh, uh, forecasting system for these frost people, right? Um, and the way we did it is we said, well, let's go look at what they're using today. And they were using this um, uh, weather forecasting thing at mesoscale, right? Uh, from this company called Western Weather. And it had certain displays and it had a real-time update, you know, rate. and they're using this for frost prevention. We thought, okay, we'll just go fork that. We'll just go and get a student to build this API. But instead of doing it at mesoscale, we'll do it, you know, at, at meter scale. But it'll feel natural. They're using it. No training. We're geniuses. Okay. In the course of doing our genius thing, we put up this like internal graphing thing, which generates real-time graphs from all of our sensors, and it's configurable. You can pick which sensors, you can pick the time frame and the colors and all that stuff. So we could see what's going on. We use it as a debugging tool. We showed this to the farmers. Now they use that. And, and we gave them the new thing, and they're like, can we have that back? We, we, I'm like, what? This is just an XY plotting tool. And they're like, no, this is great. You know, I can see it and it updates and, and this other stuff gets in my way. And they didn't articulate this at all, right? They did. So now we're going through this big interview process with them where we start with the thing they hate, but they've been using. And, and, and we have this thing that's ugly as sin that we use. There's something in between. And, and we're getting them to tell us, and it's hard, but they have ideas. They do know at some level, how they think about these things, how they think about, and it's very application specific. Um, uh, you know, even if they don't tell you, you can sort of quiz it out of them. So, so our attempt to do this is very much to, to try and work with these people who are not computer scientists, figure out what skill sets they've got, whether they know they have them or not, start with the abstractions they're using, and then prepare to be surprised. Um, uh, and, and that has generated interesting results for our collaborators, but I cannot say it's generated anything interesting from a programming language perspective yet. We haven't figured out how to codify that into anything meaningful. Um, uh, so I, I think you're absolutely right. Domain experts have a lot to tell us uh, in this space um, uh, you know, as they think about these things. Um, and then, and then we've also worked with researchers, you know, like a lot of the ecology stuff and, and there it's a very different story. They actually know what they want the data to look like. And they have very, very distinct ideas about what the abstraction should be. And so on and so forth. And, and in some sense, it's kind of easier. Awesome. Really appreciate the answer, Rich. Oh, sure. No problem. Any other questions for Rich? We're a healthy 10 minutes past the scheduled time. So oh, maybe sorry. with that, okay. um, no, not your fault. Uh, you know, very interesting talk. Appreciate it. Uh, with thank that, uh, why don't we thank Rich? And, uh, thank you know, I think if you have more questions, I'm sure Rich is good about responding to emails and so on. So please do. You bet. Reach Absolutely. Out to Get in touch. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I hope, look forward to seeing you all in person someday after, after we're all seeing each other in person again. Great. See you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.